Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the Pandemic live stream series. Today, we're going to be going back to Sword and Shield, but what I want to focus on today is I'm going to be using the axe. I want to look at some of the ways that we can use the axe when fighting with Sword and Shield. Because I have no protection over my hands at all, it is incumbent upon me that every action I do, I'm not going to lose my fingers. Doesn't matter how good you are, if you lose the ability to grip your axe, you are no longer in that fight. So today, I want to focus on that. I have done another video on tomahawk and knife. And you're going to see some similarities between the tomahawk and the use of this one. So thank you again, John, for joining me. Pleasure to be here. John has the sword and shield, and I'm going for the ax. Now, I will tell you that, well, actually, no, I will not tell you. John will tell you because we just did a little bit of play with it. John, what's it like having an ax like this coming at you, even though you know I'm not trying not to hit you? It's terrifying. Um, the, the, the weight on that tool just is the, the potential of what it can do and the damage. This ax particularly here, we actually shaved the edge off of this. It is completely blunt, but I know for a fact even lightly impact with this thing here on any part of my body is just going to be really damaging. And that goes back to something I said earlier in another video. A dull axe is still an axe. So make sure that before you ever swing an axe at somebody, you have the ability to not hit them. That's, I've seen a lot of people play with dull axes and because they did not have the ability to not hit them, their friends went away with sore or injured knees or arms or hands. Now they were geared up wearing masks and sometimes jackets, sometimes not, because if you're doing a fight in the Nordic style, Viking style, you're probably not going to have a mask or a gambeson on. You will put a mask on because there's only so many risks that you're willing to take. And nor should you fight without a mask. John and I have crossed weapons a number of times with mixed weapons, and I know I can trust him to not hit me, and vice versa. In fact, we were just warming up, and I had a swing at his knee because he was front-weighted, and I got no further than here when I said it's mine, and he agreed with me. So I didn't need to go any further than here because I knew I had the time to take his knee. And when I'm holding it down here at the end, I have the reach. Now on my ax, this is, uh, I believe it's a cold steel ax. Yep. And what I did is I actually took a sander to the bottom of it because I wanted to be able to feel where the end was and hook my pinky in that. So when I'm swinging it around, I've got a little extra control over it. I don't fight with it at the base very often. So I want to discuss this versus the tomahawk. Could you grab me the tomahawk, please? Yes, sir. This one, if I was going to be fighting with this one with my hand at the bottom, I would not want to have a shield. It's at that point that I'd be fighting with it more two-handed to get in close and do those kinds of things. So with this one, what I'm going to do is I will sometimes hold it here, but that's only when I'm trying to get an uh, extra amount of reach. And then to bring it back, I'm going to hold it about two-thirds of the way down. So that's how much space. So I'm no longer at the base because especially once I start to get tired, that's just going to pull it out of my hand. But if I have it here, I still have the ability to use 
the haft of my ax, and I have more control. And if I need that extra range, it doesn't take much to do the transfer. When we're looking at an ax, it's, or a tomahawk, it's significantly lighter. You can, now this one, of course, is uh, a synthetic cold steel. Can you grab my steel one that, that one? I fight with? Yeah. And so it's a significantly smaller head. But if I'm holding the tomahawk at full haft, and I look at where I was holding this one, which is about there, it's really about the same range as full haft in the tomahawk. Now, this is one that I fight with. And with this one, I want you to see this. So this is the tomahawk I fought with. And when you look at the edge or the handle, you can see all the chips and everything that's in here. And that's all from people like John trying to hit me with a sword. And I will tell you from experience, I dislike being hit by a sword. So learned how to use this. With this one, again, I can hold this one at full haft because it's light enough. But if I put the heads together, that is right about where I was talking about where I like to hold the ax to give me that little extra space. So some drills that we're gonna do with the ax. This is gonna, I'm gonna refer back to the tomahawk class several times. Um, we're only really gonna use five cuts, five cutting actions. So one is gonna be a descending from my right to my left. Two is gonna be descending from my left to my right. Three is gonna be horizontal from my right to my left. Four is gonna be horizontal from my left to my right. Now, I wanna tell you why I had to pause. In saber cutting patterns and in the way that I was talking about the tomahawk in the last video that I did on tomahawk and knife, let me go through that cut pattern real quick. One is descending from my right to left. Two is descending from my, right to the, my left to right. Three is ascending from my right to left. Four is ascending from my left to my right. Five is horizontal from my right to left. Six, horizontal from left to right. Seven, straight down the middle. And then we have our thrust, or we can call that eight. I'm doing it a little differently with this one because it's so heavy. I have one descending from my right to left, two descending from my left to right, three is going to be horizontal, right to left, four horizontal left to right, five straight down the middle, thrust. That being said, we are going to use ascending blows. However, they are not necessarily to attack my opponent. I'm gonna use those defensively. So we can call those one and two, defensive cuts rising. So if John gives me a cut one, I do a rising cut one to set it aside. If he gives me that cut one, and I try to do that with a rising two, punish me, go slow. Yep. He can adjust it and just take my fingers. And having my fingers hit by a sword is something I truly, truly dislike. It is an unpleasant sensation. So I would do a rising cut one against a his cut two. Two. And a rising cut two against his rising cut one. Now you'll notice I'm not cutting up into it like it's a sword. That's just going to put me in danger, go slow, because he doesn't need to do much to change his grip. But if I, no, leave it there. If I simply turn it to a flat, look how much more or how much space I've removed my hand. Go ahead and hit me in the hand. We're going to go really slow. Cool. Do it again. Hit me in the hand. 
even if I capture it on my haft, I still run the risk of it sliding down right into my fingers. Let's switch sides, please. Mm -hmm. Do that again. And I might knock it away, but I might not. You only have one chance to learn. You know, usually I'll joke in, you've got five opportunities. No, you really only have one. Because if you lose a finger or you break more than one, you're not going to be doing anything really. You can fight with broken fingers. But if you break more than one, you're not going to be able to grip it. If I only break my index finger, I can still fight. But if I break more than one finger, there's no way I can hold on to it. Do that again, hit me in the hand. I run that risk. But if I slap it with my flat, do it again. Look how much further, go slow. Stop. Look how I've removed, continue on that same line. No, that same line. Continue down. No, not on me, on the same line you were on. Yep. I hold, I make contact. Look how far away my hand is from his blade. And so I protect myself by using the flat. And if we refer to other videos on this channel, this would be when we've talked about using the false edge. And I believe that was on May the 5th yes, that we did the false edge. And this is that same kind of thing in that I'm as if I'm using my flat edge, but because it's an ax and a half, I'm using my flat. So if you'll give me that one again, okay. I can set that aside. Give me that two. And then do that again. Give me that two, please. When I strike with a ascending blow against his two, I am not knocking it out this way because he can really still use his sword. Go ahead and don't, don't fall off the path. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, look how he's able to go over that way, and that leaves me in a lot of trouble. However, what I want you to focus on is as you throw that flat, instead of continuing on that path that takes the axe and all the weight outside, as soon as you reach just to the left side of your face, pull it back to your shoulder. So it's going to be this. And it happens in my wrist. As I come up, I hit his sword, and as soon as I hit his sword, I drop my elbow and I turn my wrist over, and that takes me to my shoulder. Go ahead and give me a give me a bit of a blow. All right. And that takes me there. Scared me just a little bit. As it should. Remember, swords and axes are dangerous. It should. Be nervous, be aware, but don't let it make you hesitate. Because when you hesitate, you get hit. But you need to respect these for what they are. So let's do that again, please. Same. Same thing, please. See how that leaves me at my shoulder to just come right back down. And this would be where I would use it if he had a defensive tool like his shield in place. Now he can attack here, and if I had a sword, I could do this. But really, he's just gonna power through it or slide right down my fingers, or right down my half into my fingers. It's not a sword, I don't have guard, quillins, so I cannot use it that way. So from here, he throws that, hook it, and then drive in. Let's switch sides, please. I'm gonna keep my, my shield down so you can see it. It comes in, go slow. Now, he's got his shield there, and he's covering against that potential blow. But I know that's covered, so as I swing in and he covers, I then pull my right elbow back and then go right forward again. Let's do that again, please. Mm -hmm. You get it too late on that. Yep. Do it again. Ah, didn't make it that time, so now I'm just going to push it in and... Last week, we talked about don't use your shield like a door because it guides their point right into your face. I can make their shield act like a door with a thrust. So that's what I happened there. Let's do that again, please. 
I got the opening and I can stab them. Do it again. I'm a little bit late, so I stab it and I turn it in. And there's where my point comes in and I can drive my axe head into his face. Yes, he's still going to be trying to hit me with the sword. But let's switch sides. Let's do that same thing again. So we're in here. I've got that there. Drop your shield. That's where my the beak of my axe is coming in for his chin or his throat. Okay. So uh, I'm going to come in at the flat of your shield. Okay. I don't want you to just stand there. Got it. Nice and slow. I'm safe. Go ahead and keep going. And I'm still able to punch him with the rim of my shield. And just using my elbow allows me to rotate my shield around my body. When I'm teaching this or describing it, can I just rest it on you for a second? Yes, sir. The way I like to think of the sword and shield or axe and shield is as if I'm boxing. So I'm in here. I've got my, my left hand back protecting my jaw. I've got my right hand out. I fight soft, south paw often when I'm doing unarmed. But I can just also shift. And if we look at sword, sword and shield or axe and shield, by taking this pugilism, pugilist position, I've got my left hand up. There's my strikes, there's my drive. I've got my, I don't need to keep my hand up by my jaw because I have that whole shield, which protects this, which means I still have all that punch. My jab is now a cut or a thrust with my weapon. So I not only have the jabbing and cutting action, I also have the force multiplier of the tool with an extra hinge here in my hand and my wrist. So if we look at this more from a boxing position, thank you. So we're in here, face him. We're in, a, in this kind of boxing position and instead of being up here, like we would if we didn't have weapons, I'm down here, we're both down low. And the reason for that is goes back to that rule of one high, one low, one in, one out. So if I'm, oops, sorry, if we're in here and we're fighting this way, when I come up to protect my jaw, it's just a roll of the shield elbow. So that means that when he throws this cut two and I do a dis ascending defense, he's got that in place. So pull it in just a little bit. So I do that, but he's able to still maintain coverage. As I drive it in, he doesn't move or he doesn't just stay there. He moves. So I punch that and now stay there. I'm throwing this descending blow. Go ahead and relax for a second. Relax, relax, relax. As if when I'm throwing it, I'm hooking down through. I'm going to hit, okay? okay? Gently. It's that blow that I'm doing followed by a back fist. One more time. One, two. Now, when I add my shield, so let's do that again. One, two, and I'm back in place to strike other things. And I end up with that, what we would use as a backhand in our pugilism becomes a way to unwind my shield, if you will. Don't do anything. So I'm in here. I drive it down. Now I'm looking over this rim at my opponent's face. Put your sword on my shield. Go ahead and go straight forward, slow. Uh, just get off. Oh, there you go. Geometry says, because of my boss, he's not going to be able to hit me. But I'll tell you, this is really, really heavy holding up my shield, my arm, his arm, and his sword. So go ahead and push down. I unwind, I let go of him, and I'm able to come back in. 
So the skill I want you to work on. You don't need weapons for this bit. Be my bob. We'll start here like this. It'll come up onto my shoulder. Descending punch. Uh, no, hold on, sorry. It'll come up, down. So there's my deflection, my strike. My elbow comes back, I push forward. As I punch with a descending blow, thumb down. Then as soon as I pass Bob, I bend my elbow, but my elbow stays out where it is. Then, now my shield is right here. Then when I drop my elbow down, I unwind my shield and I turn around and I'm right back up to high guard. If you'll just stand there, you don't need anything. So I'm here, I slap, down, thrust, punch. I can still see him over my shield. Don't block him out with your shield. You, that's why we have to have thumb down. Bend it down, I can still see him. Then as I, I lose him for just a moment, but I'm in process of moving. Let's switch sides, please. So you're gonna lose me here, but I strike up, down, thrust, punch. I can still see him. And there's where I'm able to protect myself again. That's the drill that you can use to get used to moving your shield around your body so that you minimize the amount of time that your face is covered. There are times you gotta cover your face. You know? um, I'm a big advocate of don't block your vision. I'm a bigger advocate of don't get stabbed in the face. Always seemed like good advice to me. I still follow it. So let's go ahead and do that again. So the attack comes in. Ooh, there it is right there. There's that right there. There's that thrust to the face with the beak of my ass. Johnny is so kind to let me kick him around like this. I mean, not that he has a whole lot of choice, but it's good to be me. I love my job. So, so let's go do that again. So he comes in. I set that aside. Oh, that time I got it. So I punch him to cover that and then drop your shield. Then I'm just driving my beak into his ribs while I'm covering myself from this. And then he can't hit me. He can go low, but because, go ahead and go away from that. No, you're going to want to go away from that point. Yeah. I can still follow through with this. I want to tell you about another fight that John and I were in. With this shield, by the way. I had a shield and buckler because kids are jerks. <laughs> I threw a punch at John. He backed up. He did everything right. This is also on the videos. This is a fight at Britain or demos at Britain Middle School. I threw a punch. He deflected that. I kicked him. He moved that. I punched. He stepped back. Go ahead and move your hand down. I'm not going to hit you. So I was right here. So I took my buckler. And I did that. And we were wearing gorgets, but it was just enough to hit him in the throat because that's what allowed me to gain that extra inch and a half, two inches to do a punch to the throat, which I guarantee you will get their attention. I'm going to let you know that even lightly getting punched in the net throat with a shield is enough. So if we have the fact that somebody's genuinely going to drive that in there, you're going to have a bad day. So there's the drill for the rising blow from my right to my left. So a rising one against his descending two. One more time. And there's where everything ends up. And it allows me to really control the situation. But what if I'm tired? I'm no longer able to hold it here. Now I'm holding it here. I think we've been in this position too. Yeah. Um, can, can, if you don't mind. We've actually been in uh, 
down a little more. This position. It's uh, That's right. I remember. I lost my shield. No, I took your axe from you. you. I took your rapier. <laughs> you took my axe, and so I had to buy a new mask. He had. He had the axe. Uh, we didn't have shield at the time. Actually, we did. Did we? All right. We had um, arm strap. Oh, arches, that's right. So the hands were free. Bout. Um, so he thrust. I stepped aside, actually, and I grabbed his Who's sword. Because it's a it's a strap shield, not a center grip. Yep. So I went, ha ha, I am lucky. He let go, so I had a shield and a sword. Suddenly pulled me over here, and I went, huh? Well, let me see if I can still hit him. So he gra catches it right there. Yep. Reaches under. Uh, no, he reaches under yep. this way and rips, rips it, it away. But there's the one last bit that we all need to see. Let's rotate again. I jammed it in his shoulder. Can anybody see my right arm at the moment here? He completely stopped me right here and then punched me four times in the face before I realized I should probably lay down. With his axe. Mine. So remember... Just because you doesn't, just because you don't have a weapon at this moment in time, does not mean that you don't have a weapon. So, I'm tired. I'm holding it like this now. He swings in at me. I have range now. I have a good chance to win this fight. He swings in at me. You want a two or a one, sir? Uh, give me a two because you wouldn't attack that side. Now, did you see how I pulled it into my leg? He's going to step back and pull that. And I'm going to follow him home and just drive my beak into his chest. Let's do that again. So he attacks. I guide it in to my axe. So do that again. Mm -hmm. Stop when you hit my shield. I haven't lost vision of him. I can still see him. My axe comes up and I do a transfer, if you will. And then I just guide it down into my leg because I've already taken all the energy out. Then I just step forward and I drive the beak of that ax right into his chest or his face or his throat. It's really my choice. And it's good to have choices. Let's do that one more time. Mm -hmm. So he attacks and it can really come through that fast. Let's switch sides. Yeah. This is a really hard one to see. Let's come a little bit closer. All right. It's really difficult to see is what, what I'm doing to his leg right now with my sword, which is next to nothing. I'd like you to actually hit me. Sure. My shield stopped it. Then I can just step forward. And because it's not a razor blade, even if he's pulling back, there's no pressure on it. And see how I'm keeping it on my leg? What's he going to do? You know, I'll tell you what he's going to do. And this with a very sharp knife. He's going to cut my trousers like that. That was with a sharp knife. I was trying to put it away and I missed it. Don't ask. Whole nother story. So he attacks. I cover that and I transfer and then I just drive forward. And I'm keeping it on my leg the whole time. Rot and, yeah. Let's rotate real quick here. Let, notice. Let's do it again. Yeah. Come here. I want you to see where my point is if we can see that. At no point is my point being able to get back in front of him. It's always behind him here. And so I can't recover it to get back in the fight. If I didn't take that step, he easily pulls that back and I walk onto his point. Again, another thing I dislike. So I shall not do that. This is where you have to have the courage to move forward even when their weapon is in contact with you. I've said this in other videos and I'll say it over and over and over again. Even if it does mortal damage, which never been in a fight that was like that, nor do I ever want to be. But I will tell you from reading, dying is a long ways from dead. Even if it's a mortal injury, you have two choices you can make. You can either go like in the movies, I am killed and lay down or decide that you're going to take that guy with you. Me, I think I'm going to go for option two. 
Because if I'm going to go, I'm going to make sure I take somebody with me so I'm not lonely. So let's do that again. It comes in. And I cover, I transfer, and I follow through. He had a moment of time there. And that's because he attacked from being close to me. So this is really, go ahead and swing without footwork, no footwork. I'm not worried about it because he can't hit me. I know that. And I have a shield here. Go ahead and do that again. I understand distance, so I'm not worried about it. I'm not going to move. You're going to hit me. But when he steps forward, he's well within range to do a good, significant blow. And if I leave my shield here, go and do it again. His hand actually moves in the same line as my shield, and that's how he gets inside. If, on the other hand, do that again, I panic and I just, no, don't, go slow, go slow. I panic and I cover my face. There's no reason for him to continue with that cut. Oh, he just turned it into a thrust, and now I'm going to die with a thrust. So I can't block my vision, but I know the distance he has. So he takes that cut and I take it, but as I take it, I step forward with my ax. And now he's not gonna stay there. He's stepping back and I'm just moving with him. So I'm using the tempo of his foot to close distance with him to maintain control of his weapon against my body. I know it sounds crazy. I, I know it sounds dangerous, but they're not lightsabers. They're not razor blades. I can take that. And even if it was really sharp, going through my clothing, then into my flesh, it's going to be such a small scratch. I've done worse walking through rose gardens. So last one, he attacks. I cover, he doesn't stop. And I, there's my strike. So I'm able to use this as a transfer tool. With that, we're going to go ahead and close this up. Hey, guys. I want to have John tell you about what he learned from this shield and axe versus shield and sword video. And the reason I want John in here to do this is he has such a unique point of view for feedback because not only are we using the rebated swords and axes, but he's one of the few people that have swung sharp steel at another person. And so I want to talk to John a little bit about this. So John, thanks yeah. for being willing to talk to us about this. Oh, my pleasure. Tell me, what did you find about fighting against or moving against an axe and a shield. So we made the joke beforehand, of course, it's scary. Yeah. Um, but the truth of it there is coming back to this, the part where we did tests on these shields here with sharp swords. Um, and the one thing we didn't do, and it was a reminder as we were working on this, um, especially when we worked on that cl up close grip where we were underneath the head of the axe, this is where it really the came into play. Grip. Yeah, the choke grip there choke grip. Um, this reminded me when we did the test with these shields with Hacking Civilization. By the way, people, check him out. Yeah, um, definitely. Shannon Moore, Hacking Civilization. He's the one that built these shields, and they are fantastic shields. Um, just to, real quick before we move on more, I just want you to look at the face of the shield. Here's where the axe is cutting in, and you can see what it's doing to the hide of the shield here, let me move it a little bit closer. So you can see how it's actually cutting in, but because it's not, John wasn't just standing there and using it like a door and letting me cut into the door with an ax, because he's taking angles, I'm just sliding off. He's sliding, he's shedding right away from me there. I'm not gonna absorb that impact. So take a look at Hacking Civilization. It's a wonderful piece. but. When we tested these here, we did a different test than we've seen a lot of people do shield tests. You held the shield. Which I'll tell some, you is scary. Put on some protective gear, which thank you for that, <laughs> and then asked me to take a sharp sword and swing at him. Yeah, one of the things I wanted to do, which was a little different than what we see in a lot of testing of shields, is... Either the shield is stationary, it's on a 
on a holder and they're just hacking into it, again, then it's a door. Or if somebody's holding it, they're focusing on hitting the shield. And any martial artist, any person knows that if somebody has a shield, I don't want to hit the shield, I want to hit the guy holding it. So in our test, I specifically asked John to hit me. And I was wearing that male that's right behind us. So that he, if I messed up, which it was entirely possible, I would still have the protection on. So, and I want that background here right now because when we did that test, it was a very different fight. My sword would cut into the shield a little bit with many of my cuts. And I'd either bind in it or I would get slowed down or I'd simply just stop with the bind there in the, sh in the, in the shield. Can I add to that bind? Please, yeah. So, how he hit was actually something that because of the way he was striking, but also because of the way I was defending. If I've got the shield and we're here and he cuts in at me on this side and I do that, it's a shallow cut. Do it again. He does that and I jam my shield into it. It was a deeper cut. So I actually affected the depth of his penetration into my shield with how I responded to it. And that's a really important piece to look at there. So when we played the choked grip with the shield and, and axe, I looked at the, the actual technique of what was happening in that, the, the actual thing that happened if this was a sharp weapon fight. What would have happened? Well, my sword would have bitten into his shield and got stuck, got jammed in there. Can we talk about the sword real quick? Yeah. You mentioned another thing earlier before we started filming, and that's if I have a sharp sword, and John has a sharp sword, I am not yeah. going to be swinging my sword with the power that would be required to cut his arm off. And the reason is that if I miss, all that energy pulls my sword around behind me, opening up. If I'm giving everything that I've got to take a swing at Stephen right now here, and I don't make contact, and I'm going to go over here, all that energy has to go somewhere. I'm not just going to stop that here without an injury. I've already torn the shoulder trying to do something similar. It's not going to happen without severe injury. It's got to go somewhere, and that's going to create a large motion. Which is all my target. Look at everything here. So if I'm fighting somebody who's got a sharp sword, why am I going to cut them like I'm trying to cut through a bottle? And remember, this is a force multiplier. It's not a hammer. So it's not like you're trying to pound a nail into a board. You are hitting this knowing that there's going to be a transfer transference of energy through the edge so you're not swinging it like a hammer. You don't need to. That's fallacy. It's an unnecessary force piece here right now. I don't need more than that simple action right there a lot of the time. Just that simple extension. Right there. But the physics of the sword weapon do the job for you. Uh, that's something that I was working with Adam Savage on, on his show, building Savage Builds. We've been taught that we need to swing our sword hard. The problem with that is that all that energy is still in place. We go back to Newtonian laws. So if you don't hit another object to stop your weapon, me, your weapon's going to continue pulling you around until something stops it, you. And if you're out of place, but I'm not, I now have this huge amount of time to attack into, or you have that huge amount of time to attack into me. Would you agree? I would agree, absolutely, yeah. So we're not going to be swinging these swords like sledgehammers. But let's take it back to that choked grip on the axe. So John, go ahead, please. Yeah. So. When you were there, when I threw the cut, what would I do? What's my sword going to do? We talked about that with that sharp. It's going to bite into his shield here. And when we worked on this here, we looked at transference of tool. So he first initiated his defense with his shield. So, and then he didn't pull the shield back. He pushed 
his axe half forward. I punched his sword blade with my axe out. What's that going to do if it's a sharp weapon? It's going to get it out of his shield. And there means that he is able to do the second action, which is once that goes, roll over the top while he drops it down and strike. Because if he doesn't do that, my sword's stuck in his, in his shield. So if he rotates, is he going to be able to do the same thing? Yeah, I, not with that extra lever that he's got hooked into me. If you attach two things together right now, Okay, and you try to manipulate one yeah, end, if, right? You can, he can manipulate one end. I can also manipulate the other end here right now. And he has much more control than I have. So that transference, uh, so if you'll put your, your, your sword here, mm -hmm. right? So it's bit, it just bit into the edge of my shield. My axe does that, and then I guide it down so I can punch forward. Because as we've discussed in other videos, every action is a combination of contraction and expansion. If I'm fully expanded, I can't expand anymore. And when I've blocked it out and I've punched out to remove him from my shield, I'm expanded. There's no further place I can go with that axe. So I have to contract. He's not going to be able to do it a whole lot there if he just walks forward with this extended. And I'm guessing he's probably not going to just stand there and let me do it either. No. <laughs> One can hope. Dreams <laughs> can come true somewhere else. It's just that one's not going to happen with me. So what else did you pick up from? Um, so aside from the thinking of that, just being the fascinating system of being able to test what a sharp sword and does to a traditionally made shield not a chunk of plywood a traditionally made shield there's there's a difference between the two here a chunk of plywood is going to ruin my sword and i'm not going to do a whole lot to that plywood but one of these things here it's gonna it's a lot different one thing that we did not do for safety's sake when we were doing our test is i did not use my sword defensively which means I took the full brunt of his force into my shield and there was no transference of energy. Highly recommend you go down our list here. First, of course, please subscribe. Me loves. Um, but go down our list, find our shield testing or go to Hacking Civilization. You can also find the link on his page. Um, and, and look at it. Also how he made the shield. So highly it's recommend. not a secret. It's, uh, Shannon has an amazing amount of information and in his research and his trials and errors, he has been in contact with some of the leading experts in the world in this. And he's talked to them about how to make these. So I think, you know, looking at bog finds and historical pieces, museum acquisitions, these are probably as close as we're going to get to the original ones because I don't want to fight with a thousand year old mm -hmm. shield. Not Put it up on my, on my wall, but I don't want to fight with it. Yeah. Um, but the, going back, the second thing that I, th was that, I rem that I learned here, which was a fantastic reminder, just as a martial artist training in constant all the time as much as I can. Just because your opponent's tools changed doesn't mean you have to change your technique. Um, we have a few techniques, and you can find them in a few of our classes and everything there, if you've ever trained with us or seen any of our videos, where you simply take a tool and you bypass it, and it's up. That close to me, because I'll just move the target right on past me here. And... I was able to do that with a weapon that has almost the same mass as my sword and almost all of that mass is at the very top where that axe is swinging. And I did the same technique I do to be able to collect a sword and I moved that axe right past me and away from me. But when he did, can you do that again? Yeah. As John mentioned, look how close he keeps it to his body. His elbow stays in. It's going out a little bit now, but that's because of the chair. But the elbow stays in tight to the body He's using the false edge of the sword 
to move my attacking weapon outside of his silhouette. So even though I have a weapon with the, the same approximate mass as his sword, and I'm hitting him with that same mass in this one head, he's still able to move it out with that. So Train, train hard, but more importantly than training hard, train correctly. And as important inside of that train correctly part, trust yourself. And trust the, the actions. Technique and trust the actions. If you don't have the trust behind it, it's never going to work. If you trust in yourself to do it, and you trust in the action that it's going to keep you safe, it's going to work. One of my favorite sayings in class, in the side sword class and other classes, but we see it a lot in side sword and long sword. If you don't trust an action, the action won't work. If the action doesn't work, how could you trust it? And it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. So you need to learn to trust your actions, train them until you no longer need to think about them. And the trust is built in that repetition. But once you've trained your body and your mind to do certain actions, they'll do it. The tool is not as important as the weapon. Did you pick anything else up? Um, those and that was the, a lot. Those are the biggest things that I have right there. Um, there's so much to be able to feel and work with there. John, thank you for training with me. But more importantly, thank you for trusting me. And thank you for protecting me. It's my pleasure, sir. We're swinging swords and axes at each other. And it is scary. And you should respect these tools because they will hurt. Yep. Thanks, everyone. Take care, everybody. I hope you enjoyed this. Please click on the subscribe button below. We have lots of other videos that you can watch. We have instructional videos for Western martial arts, HEMA. We also have a lot of fantastic interviews with some really knowledgeable people about martial arts, movies, TV, stuntmen, directors, all sorts of great people. So hit the subscribe button and join us for these videos. Until we're able to meet again, stay safe, stay sane. Thank you for being with us, and we'll see you on the other side of this. Thanks, everyone. Boom.